Good morning, everybody. Um, before we actually uh, begin our, our formal and official program, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge and take a moment to um, share for those who don't know, there was a Hamas attack in Jerusalem earlier today, uh, the chain gate outside of the uh, Temple Mount area. Uh, it resulted in a few injuries, serious injuries, and uh, the murder of Eliyahu David Kay. May his memory be a blessing. Our thoughts are very much with our friends in Israel. Orit is in Jerusalem right now. I really appreciate her being here with us this morning and giving all of her positive energy uh, despite uh, the events that are going on on the ground. So thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Daryl now. Thanks, Stacey, and good morning to everyone as well. And thanks for joining us today. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Daryl Antel, and I am co-chair of the Edmonton UJA campaign, along with Howie Snyderman. And the Edmonton UJA and Calgary UJA are pleased to bring you today's event. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it should be a lot of fun, and we're going to jump right into it. I just have a few housekeeping notes. Um, just so everyone knows, we are recording this. Um, but we would love if everyone kept their cameras on. We want the event to be interactive and we want to be, uh, Stacey and Arit want to be able to see who they're speaking to and we'll do questions as we go as well as maybe field some at the end depending on how the timing works. Uh, in terms of posing those questions though, uh, if everyone could keep their Zoom on mute while we're uh, live during the presentation, put your questions in the chat and then uh, I think uh, Stacey or Susan will moderate those and pose them as we go. Um, and then the only, only other thing to mention is in the elected event, we have a, a Zoom uh, bombing, which is when someone uninvited joins the, the event. Our, our policy is just to end the event immediately just to deal with that. I think that's unlikely, but we like to tell everyone if, if things shut down, they know why. And with that taken care of, let's jump right into it because we do have a, a full program. I want to say welcome to Shauna and Arit, and uh, please take it away. Okay. So I think that's my cue. That's Hi, cue. everybody. Good that's morning. Fine. And uh, it's eight o'clock for us here in Israel. And it's so nice to be with everybody. And um, for all those who just entered, if you can put your cameras on, it makes it way more fun um, and uh, more interactive. And uh, this is the holiday of light that we're celebrating. And um, you know, it's, it's part, part of the holiday is, you know, it's very much of a home-based holiday where you invite people into your home and you, and each person brings the light into the home. And I think that we have definitely realized the value of each and everybody's light, um, having missed it and having been cooped up on our own and isolated for so many. So I hope this brings a little bit of light, a little bit of joy sparks some inspiration, gives you a, a hint of Israel and uh, from my kitchen and from Arit's home in Jerusalem. Um, I'm Shauna Goodman. I'm, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not exactly a native born Israeli. I'm a Canadian, I'm a Montrealer at heart and have been living in Ranana, Israel for the past seven years with my husband and three sons. Um, Ranana is a suburb of Tel Aviv. We're about 17 kilometers from Tel Aviv from all those who have been to Israel. And you can just give a wave up if you have been to Israel. Um, use those fun icons. Um, yay, I see some waving. And um, this class is interactive. I promise you, we're going to be jumping from my kitchen into a Ritz home, into Machana Yehuda. And really, the idea is to highlight. Um, the commonalities we have, whether being the screaming Ashkenazi here in Ranana to Orit, the, the, the Spartac maven in Jerusalem, and, um, <laughs> and also, you know, the Ola Harasha and, um, you know, Orit, who comes from generations of Israelis. And, you know, just the, the fact that we can always come together around holidays and, of course, around food. And, and sharing different hints and flavors and ideas. So um, I were, the class is live. We have now 50 minutes together. I'm thrilled. Um, Stacy's online with the chat box. She's gonna be you know, um, saving questions that we can ask. Um, and we're looking forward to a really exciting um, uh, 50 minutes together. So first of all, I'm, I'm Throwing you back to Jerusalem, to Orit, 
where you can get a glimpse of my sidekick, my partner. We lead women's tours, food tours here in Israel, and she is the Neshama of Israel. So, all right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you today. Before I will say anything about myself, I want to show you a bit about the market. And I want to take you straight to Machane Yehuda. There it is. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, a bit about the atmosphere of the market. Those who have been to uh, Israel and Jerusalem probably know this uh, amazing shuk market. Uh, so uh, my name is Orit. I'm a Jerusalemite tour guide. I was born and raised in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, when I was 20-ish, I did the obvious and went to live in Tel Aviv like everyone does. But then after a few years, I surprised everyone, mainly myself, and I came back to Jerusalem. And I live in the city for many, many years. And my favorite place is in the market. It's where everything happens. This is the place where I drink my coffee at. This is where I drink my beer at night. This is where I uh, buy my uh, fruits and vegetables. I spend uh, at least three or four days a week in the market. And it's really a great place to be, very vibrant and happy place. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today. And um, I want to ask Shauna, what are we going to make today? So Stacy gave me the ultimate challenge of giving a mix of Sephardic and Ashkenazi meals and incorporating Hanukkah at the same time, something that's easy, something that's, you know, everybody can find the ingredients. And, and I, I love when I'm given the challenge. So um, I'm starting off with uh, cheese latka because in Montreal, I don't know about you, we were all about the latka. It was the excuse to eat a latka and usually a potato latka that, thank God we had a food processor because you know that's really the only way to make the lacy ones and the crispy ones and to actually be smiling as you're making the latkas because it really is a labor of, our, of, lo of love, these latkas. And, um, and then I started to think about something that's a little bit um, more interesting just than the potato one. And I know people are doing potato and zucchini and carrot and sweet potato, and they're all beautiful. And, you know, the more the merrier. Um, but I remembered a teacher of mine, Gil Marks, um, who unfortunately passed away about 15 years ago. And I remember living in New York City, and he came to teach us a cooking class. And he talked about these Ashkenazi cheese latkes and uh, they made an impression on me. And I happen to love anything like sweet cheese, like the inside of a Montreal cheese bagel is like the best thing in the whole entire world. So imagine the inside of a cheese bagel fried up and a little bit crispy and with how dark it is right now, there's nothing will slip down easier. So I feel I felt like that was just um, my little screaming Ashkenazi, and I, I did 23 in me, and I'm believe it or not, 99% Ashkenazi. So this is this is where I come from. Um, so we're going to be making that, and then the next thing we're going to be doing is highlighting olive oil because this is the harvest, the asif, as they say, right? Is that is that right, Orit? Asif, um, masik. It's a, ma almost masik. the same. Almost yeah. the same. I, I, this <laughs> story of my life, it is almost there, good enough. And, um, and so the olives are falling off the trees now. And um, I brought one of the branches that's right in my neighborhood. As you can see, there's the olives right on it. And don't 
don't think you can just like grab it and eat it because that's like a really big no-no because it really is horrible. You have to like, there's a whole process to making olives, which we'll go into. Um, um, but all this to say, we're going to be celebrating the salad, which highlights the extra virgin olive oil, which is coming from the north and um, which is probably one of the oldest trades imaginable here. So talk about authentic, like that is where we go to start from the very beginning. So I'm going to start with, I don't know if I have any hands up, anybody cooking with me because the recipes were given out. They are complete. You can sit back, relax, just watch, take in all the sensations. But if you are, um, stop me if I do go a little bit too fast. Um, but we're starting with cheese latkes and I'm starting off with some like cheese, like um, farmer's cheese or like pressed cottage cheese, or you can use ricotta cheese, something that's white and sort of like dryish and really not so flavorful. My son says it just tastes like milk, mommy. It just tastes like lots of milk. Um, but it's really, really yummy. And it, it, it just, it binds well and um, it's, it's very easy to work with. So that's what I have in the bowl here. And we're gonna be adding eggs. Eggs are my, my fluffiness and also eggs are my glue. So that's gonna bind everything together. So I'm adding two large eggs. And whenever I'm calling for eggs, it's always a large egg unless it's something else identified. Um, and you should always be keeping your eggs in the box that they come from, or when they come home, put them in a special box because they take in all the odors of your fridge and it lengthens their shelf life when they're covered. So it's just a little bit of a helpful tidbit. Um, also, we're gonna be adding my magic vanilla that comes in my suitcase from Canada. So anytime you wanna bring something home to someone in Israel, bring them pure vanilla because it's like liquid gold here. It's so expensive. So always use the best. I'm using a little bit of pure vanilla. One of my Hebrew words is tipa, is like a drop, drop, a tipa of vanilla extract. That's it, just a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna be adding a little bit of some white sugar. If you are a no sugar person, you can be using coconut sugar if you want. You can be using honey. You can be using silan, whatever you wish. And we're also gonna be using a little bit of some salt as well. Okay, and the salt balances, always balances out um, the sugar, the sweetness, but this is really, really not sweet, which is nice um, because you want to add the toppings, which are really going to, you know, you can go sweet, you can go savory, you can go whichever direction you want to be going. If you're a lemon lover, which I am, you can just microplane a little bit of some fresh lemon zest as well, which makes it extremely fresh. So I'm just mixing this up. You see, it doesn't, did you, did anybody notice my Canadian spatula? Anybody <laughs> name what, what store this is from? This is Roots, not Roots. It's, what is it everybody? Write it in the chat box. That was a trick question. Guess what the it bay. is? Yes, the bay, the bay, the bay, the bay. The bay. Um, so we don't need Hudson Bay blankets here. It's a little hot for the blankets, but I'll take the spatula. So this was a gift in someone's suitcase though. So little Canadiana in my house. Um, I'm also gonna be adding some flour and you can use spelt flour, camet flour, whole wheat flour if you want. I'm, I'm just using some white flour because that's what I had. Um, but remember when you are using any of your flours, the whole grains, which I highly, highly encourage you to do, make sure that um, you keep them sealed. And you can also, if you're not going through them very much, you can keep them in your fridge or your freezer and that will keep them from going rancid because the, because they are healthier, they have more of the germs still on it, they do go badly faster. So that's something that you wanna keep in mind. So that was pretty easy, a great thing to do with kids. Can you, everybody see it's, it's kind of thick. That's what it should be, um, totally normal. And what I'm gonna be doing is I have a regular frying pan, nonstick. And stop me if anybody has any questions, very like low key. I'm like camping here on a little Bunsen burner practically. Um, let's hope I still have gas in the can, but don't worry, I have a backup just in case. So um, I have my pan here and my little teapot teapot of oil. So I'm gonna put a little bit of some oil in the pan. And if you don't want to be using oil, you see very little, I'm not like drenching it. Okay, we're not deep frying. We still have to get into our jeans during this holiday. And some of you may be going on a holiday somewhere, especially to Israel. The skies are open. We're ready for you. Yes. So don't be, don't be shy. Book your ticket. 
and we need you here. It's just not the same. And it's sunny and gorgeous. And I wish you could see out my window, but I have oranges falling off my trees. Just to show you the proof, oranges. And it's still very tropical here. There's palm trees, and date trees, and it's, it's really good for your skin. So book your trip, make your first trip coming to Israel. And we promise we will take care of you here. So I'm thinking- Israel is not the same without you. I'm That's saying that right. Israel is not the same without the tourists. We're, we were waiting for you <laughs> for two years already. <laughs> it's way too quiet, way, way too quiet. Um, and you miss bumping into people. Like the best thing in Israel is, you know, bumping into, oh my God, I haven't seen you since summer camp. I haven't seen you since, you know, and it's somehow things are meant to be here. So that's why, please, please remember to book and, uh, and make it happen. And it may get postponed, but it will come. But aspirationally, I, oh, I tell you, it'll make your kishka still good. I promise you. So I have my, my, my dough, which is thick. No, don't panic about that. And I'm just gonna, my pan is hot and I'm gonna just drop it onto my pan. And I like to make small pancakes, not big pancakes, because then they feel less guilty and they feel like individually. So nobody wants to eat something really, really big. You wanna eat a lot of little things. So that's what I think. So I'm gonna just drop them on and they're very organic looking shapes. I'm just sort of stretching them and and moving them around a bit. Um, and I'm creative. Shona, are you using yeah. olive oil? I am in this. I, I'm using actually canola oil. Um, so you can use. I don't want these different. To have, so you can I, use different I, kinds of oils. You can use all different kinds of oils. You can do a mixture. You can also do a little bit of butter and um, oil at the same time if you want the flavor but the oil has a higher smoking point to it. But as you see, I'm not deep frying here. I'm just a little bit of a pan fry here. You know, we have the tradition of the oil, but I don't need to be wearing the oil for another six months. Like, I don't think that's, that keeps the tradition. That's not what we're trying to do, keep the tradition. We're trying to make the tradition happen and let the tradition fall off our legs. So um, <laughs> this is why I, I, I try to use oil in a way that it serves its purpose, but you know, it, it's not necessary, you know, less is more. Let's go with that, less is more. So I'm, I see that it's starting to be ready. Wow, golden, I'm gonna flip. And you can see it's a great thing to do with the family because you can talk and do it at the same time, which is always great. And everybody can have an easy job and no one can mess it up unless the um, unless of course you burn them which that is always a possibility but there's always a new batch to make so it's okay and um and there's always someone in the family who loves everything burnt so shauna if you um, have that rare moment where you don't actually finish eating the whole batch can you freeze these you absolutely can freeze them and that's what i'm going to be doing um, because this is way too many for me right tonight. And that's often what I think about whenever I'm making anything, can I freeze it? Because you love yourself when your freezer is part of your pantry and the quality does not go down because you're going to heat them up anyhow, you know, one by one in your, on your baking sheet, not on top of each other. And they're going to crisp up and be soft in the middle. So absolutely. And you can you know, make these in advance if you're having everybody over for day three or day one or whatever, you shouldn't be in the kitchen frying while everybody's coming because you need to sit and have some wine, enjoy and be with everybody. Okay. I don't want anybody hiding in the kitchen unless you're making it as a full activity for the full family. Okay. So I'm turning this off and I'm going to continue frying these and we're going to go head back to Jerusalem to be with Arif. So I just want to say that latkes are amazing, really. But, you know, in Israel, we eat sufganiyot. And sufganiyot is basically like the donuts, but you can see them everywhere. And especially you can see them in the market. So I'm going to share with you what I filmed this week in uh, Machane Yehuda market about sufganiyot. Machane Yehuda market, Hashuk. The market, as we call it, is the oldest and the biggest market in Israel. Started 120 years ago, it became the most vibrant, colorful place in Jerusalem. 
you can find here everything from houseware to fresh fruits and vegetables, fish, and the best eateries of the most famous chefs in Israel. And you can also find from the 1st of October, the best seller of Hanukkah, what we produced only two months a year, which is the Sufganiyot. Take a look at the beautiful dough, how it goes into the oil. This guy masses produce Sufganiyot. It doesn't end. <laughs> Infinity and beyond. Well, totally. <laughs> How do you open your mouth to get one of these in? Uh. You know what is my favorite, Sufganiya? This one, the plain one, the one that I remember from school, from being a kid. This is what you, we used to eat with strawberry jam inside. And this is really the best uh, nemesis ever, I think. But uh, <laughs> before I eat that, maybe we'll have something healthy. <laughs> so, we on back to you. Well, you should also know that Orit's birthday is on November 29th, a very important Jewish historical day. If anybody knows it, maybe they can win a donut. Um, write it in the chat box if you know what happened on November 29th, but that's Orit's birthday. And she gives herself permission to have one donut a year. And so she is breaking her streak for tonight for take, uh, taking okay. a that jelly donut to show you how experiential this country is. We're adapting, <laughs> experiential, and you know, it's all about the bite. So, um, okay, but really we can't live on, on donuts or latkes, let's be real. So let's celebrate a little bit of the olive oil that we were talking about. And just to show you, like when you go to a store here, the assortment of olives that are just beyond like your scope, of, it's like a candy store. Of, of how they're treated, the sizes, pitted, not pitted stuff um, with za'atar. These are pesto ones, which they smell so heavenly. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's my low blood, my, my low blood pressure, but I can stand in front of my fridge just eating bowls of olives. I love olives in all different forms, hot, cold, sliced, toppings, you know, any which way I can eat an olive. Um, so as I said, you can't eat it right off the branch. But we are going to make a salad. And the salad that we're going to be doing is going to be um, celebrate. Oh, someone got it. George Goldsend. Or read, is he correct? Because I'm not, I can't, I can't follow it exactly. But he said that the, yes, totally. the state of Israel was voted on at the UN, the vote to partition on November 29th, 1947. Give that man a donut. And the Oscar goes to George. Uh, well done. Um, okay, so um, we're going to be talking about the oranges. I told you that just fell off my tree, and um, I feel really blessed. This is, and this is the year of the shmita, where that means you're not supposed to be picking, and you're supposed to be really giving the land a rest. But that also means that anybody's tree is a free for all. So you can really go and pick and people put up signs outside their doors and say, you know, from two to four, come pick off my avocado tree. I'm like, telling Shauna this is like, you may regret that sign because I may be back every day. 
and my kids love Haas avocados. And so they are growing everywhere. And this is the season. So these are my oranges. So my oranges to you. And that's why I really wanted to show you um, about them. And I want to show you a way that I love to eat the oranges. Um, it's called to supreme an orange. And don't, don't get intimidated. All you need is a sharp knife. You cannot do this without a sharp knife. And what we're going to be doing is we're taking out the flesh of the um, orange, and you could do this with any citrus, and I promise you it will taste a thousand times better because it doesn't have um, the skin still on it, which sometimes could be chewy and sometimes could be a little bit choky. And so this is just a little bit more refined. So you, it does take more time. I'm going to give that disclaimer, but it's actually in the, in the spirit of mindfulness, in the spirit of getting grounded, which I definitely work on, this is a wonderful activity to do. So again, all you really need is a knife and a good quality orange. And because no magic will happen if the orange is not good to begin with. Um, and I'm just cutting off both ends because you always want to start off with a flat side, a flat bottom, okay? Because I don't want to be doing this and we're rolling the orange all around, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm taking my knife and I'm, I don't know if you guys can see, but I'm, I'm just running the knife around the shape of an orange. It's not a square, it's a circle. So try to keep the integrity of this beautiful fruit that came from manna in heaven, okay? So do your best and a sharp knife really helps in this. And this is practice. I promise you, promise you, um, practice makes perfect. And that is what culinary school is all about. Um, and you just chop and chop and you learn better chopping, faster chopping, safer chopping. But the best chopping happens with a great knife that is sharp. So don't try with a butter knife. Don't try, if your knives have not been touched in two years, most likely you probably need to get them sharpened and invest in it because when you have a good knife, that's all you really need, okay? Um, and your 10 fingers are extremely important to you. So knives can be bought, fingers not so much. So pay attention to that. So here we go, I have my orange that, oopsies, here we go, I missed that time, here we go. It's still round, isn't that amazing? And I'm taking a smaller knife, which is called a paring knife, and I'm going like um, along the seam of the orange, and I'm pulling out the orange. And so it's almost like imagine like you're turning a page of a book, and you're pulling out the good stuff, and um, it doesn't have the skin on it. Um, and you just do one by one and you pull it, hold it, hold it in your hand over a bowl so it catches all those deliciousness juices because the juices could be part of your salad dressing as well. So in my hand, sharp knife, and I'm just pulling the pieces out. And I don't know about you, but these are so simply delicious and it really, really tastes different. And I'm just doing one by one. And again, a great thing to do with girlfriends. You could talk, you could do a whole batch of oranges and you can have it for breakfast all week and they don't go bad. You can't freeze these though, Stacey, okay? But um, can't freeze this, but you can freeze the juice. So if you don't feel like dealing with the juice now, um, and you know, sometimes too much juice is too much sugar, you can freeze it and use it in other things. So that part can be frozen. And then with the end, look at all that juice that comes out. So really nothing gets wasted and this can go into your composter. So. That is how to supreme an orange. And I love to do this um, because look how, look how great it looks. Can you guys see how gorgeous that looks? And it's great if you have pink grapefruit and, and yellow grapefruit and oranges and clementines. It's just this citrus burst in your mouth. Um, and Ranana actually used to be, um, the word is pardesim, which is, God bless Hebrew, there's a word for every type of fruit growing, where it grows, what, what the name of the, the <laughs> there's a special verb for when you pick an orange that's different from picking an olive, that's picking from an apple, well, they don't have apples. So, you know, they, they just have a different something because I think it just highlights the integrity of what everything here matters and everything here is seasonal and everything here is so deeply attached to the agricultural cycle and the calendar. So it's, you know, being a Canadian living here and not having really had ate, eaten very locally 
Um, you know, not unless it's summer and eating strawberries and tomatoes and basil and stuff, but you know, six months are, are pretty hard, you know, that uh, we're grateful for, for the imports and stuff. But here, everything is seasonal. And like we are waiting, we're just starting to see the beginning of strawberries now. And that's super exciting. And you can never have a strawberry mango salad together because you're never out at the same time. So it's, it's just right. an interesting um, realization and, and adaptiveness that, you know, connected to the, to the calendar. So I can continue to talk. Here we go. So I'm doing some mixed greens and these are beet, um, baby beet greens, which I love. You eat with your eyes, right? So each one of them on their own has so much flavor. And then we're going to be adding some of my beautiful um, orange soup creams. And again, you're only adding this right before you're going to be serving it because it's wet, right? And you spend so much time drying your lettuces. You don't want it to be soggy. And if your lettuce is soggy, your salad dressing won't stick to it. So you always want to be start, starting off with dried greens that I spin in a salad spinner. And then I keep them in a bag, like a Ziploc bag or um, uh, a dish towel, a clean dish towel. And I have them. I much prefer to wash my own stuff than buying the stuff that is pre-washed. I find like you open that bag and you want to cry. And it doesn't even smell like a lettuce anymore. It smells like something that I don't even recognize and and it, I just feel like I, I want to wash it and you want to tear it very gradually. You don't want to wring it. It's, this is not like the juice. Um, you want to really just tear and, um, and try not to put metal to it so it doesn't oxidize. So these are some of, some of the hints. So other things to my salad that we're building in the spirit of um, Israel and the spirit of Hanukkah is dates. And um, it's we're using these amazing dates that... Um, are called medjool dates and they actually grow here and they never did until um, somebody just told me that some was it some Iraqi immigrants came with some seeds in their pockets and when they fled and they had seeds and pits I should say they had the pits and then they planted them and now Israel is like one of the biggest providers of dates is that right Orit? Yeah, and you know what is amazing is that dates used to grow, it's one of the species that used to grow here in Israel, but in the Holy Land. But then when the Crusaders came here 1,000 years ago, they decided to take all of the dates and instead of that, they started to grow sugar cane. So what happened is that the date production stopped for almost 1,000 years. And at the beginning of the 20th century, as you said, Someone brought back the dates and we started to grow again. And we are the biggest producer in the world for Majul date, which is quite amazing. And also in Israel, you can find a 2000 year old date, okay? That they found in one of the archeological expedition in Israel. And they actually took the pit and they grew it in Ktora in a kibbutz in the South and there's actually a 2000 years old date that grows in the desert. It's quite amazing. So yeah, you're totally wow. right. <laughs> amazing and amazing. It's the date that keeps on giving. Who knew a one date stand? But the dates, <laughs> I keep them in my freezer also. Um, and they're great just out of the freezer. It's like you want to slow it because they're very, very high in sugar. But they also grow they in in in, in salt, right? Or they grow with like they have a salty that yeah, out they, the um, they grow in soilty soil. And uh, what is also amazing about this fruit is that it tries to compensate by becoming more and more sweet. So basically, the saltier the soil is, the sweeter the date will be, which is quite amazing. Which is quite amazing. I think there's a lesson in there. There's a lesson for us in there. So Shauna, Odette Maslia also had uh, some information for us about the date trees that right. uh, after 1950, Israel smuggled a thousand palm trees from Iraq and got an Egyptian agri-urologist, agri sorry, agri-ecologist uh, to check them and make sure that they are authentic. And of course, we, we know that Ceylon, uh, which we're not using today, but uh, some of us may have in our kitchens, is made of these dates. Well, very, very interesting. I think she deserves another donut too with our friend who'd got November 29th. Yes, I'm a big believer of prizes, you know, especially food prizes. 
Okay, so we're gonna keep moving. And so our salad is building, as you see, with gorgeous colors and you eat with your eyes. So always pull out your best dish because every meal is a celebration. And um, if you're not gonna use your good dishes now, I don't know when we're gonna use them, okay? So pull them out, take them out of the packing that went into the basement from some move, pull it out or get rid of it. Um, and so I'm having a lot of fun using all my good stuff and rediscovering. I'm also a really big believer of putting some crunch in my salad and not more bread because God knows we don't need more bread. So I'm putting in some toasted um, uh, almonds, which are great. And I always toast my almonds beforehand because A, it increases the shelf life of them because nuts are full of fat and fat goes rancid and goes bad. So toasting them will extend their life, but also will pop the flavor, like tasting a, a nut from the store and then tasting one that you just put into the oven for five to seven minutes at 350 degrees. Wow, you could sell your house three times over. Okay, so nothing smells better than toasting nuts, but just remember when they smell too good, you know it's time to take them out of the oven. And uh, that's very important because the high fat content, especially pine nuts, I feel like the more money you spend on your nut, the faster they burn. So just keep an eye on them and don't put a load of laundry in and and, and stay kind of more focused, which, you know, is difficult. But when you are toasting your nuts, toast the whole bag. Don't toast one tablespoon at a time. Be good to yourself. Build your pantry. Make things easy, easy and streamlined for yourself. So I have my salad here, but now, so I'm going to highlight it here. And it's not dressed because you only dress the salad right before you're going to serve it. And we're gonna be adding really simple ingredients that also, again, you can use some of that delicious orange juice that we had, or I also happen to have lemon trees, guys. So I have to show off a tiny bit about my lemons. And here is one of my lemons. And anytime you wanna get your lemons going, roll it on the counter or squeeze it while you're on the phone. It's really good for your hand muscles and really good for any tension you have. You could also use it as one of those fascia balls if you have any crooked neck issues. I just went to an osteo for my first time and she was doing that. I said, I can do that with my lemons. I don't need to order that bowl online. So you can do that with your hard lemons. Um, cut it in half and always take a smell and you know appreciate what's inside of here because it's really outrageously amazing. And then what you wanna do, is take a fork and you don't need anything um, really complicated here, just a fork. And I'm gonna put my fork inside my lemon and I'm just going to squeeze. Okay, this is live. You know, Shauna, this is one of the best tips I ever took from you, really. This is so uh -huh. easy. Really, it's so easy to, you know, just squeeze the lemon with a fork. Who would have thought about it? <laughs> Who would have thought and there's, Nothing left. Wow, smells so fantastic. And look how much juice I just got. And guys, this is live. I don't have this pre-done, pre okay? Um, and as far as I'm concerned, you can't, you can't start cooking if you don't have fresh lemons in your house. Like, wow, what a difference. Smells like heaven. Then we're gonna be also adding garlic. And I'm a big believer of using, and listen, if you had any pits in it, I had no pits, I don't know why, but it's a lucky day. You can use one of these strainers because you don't want pits in the salad dressing. Um, take your garlic and often people say, oh, I don't like using the fresh garlic. It gets stuck in my nails. Okay, I have no nails, but still it burns. It just it doesn't feel good. And then I'm going to smell like garlic all day. Not true. Just bang it. And that's called bruising your garlic and it won't get stuck in anything. And the peel just comes right off. Um, come so, that's my little French. I'm growing up in Montreal. I have this wonderful garlic press that I think was a shower present 25 years ago. It doesn't die. Buy good stuff and you won't have to replace them. And just push it right through. Whenever I'm using garlic in a salad dressing, I always use a press because I feel like it, it minces it way more. And here's our date honey, which is also called, everybody scream it out. Anybody know? See lad. Yes, Ceylan, everybody. This is a wonderful condiment to have in your fridge, and not in your fridge, in your pantry. It does not need to be, um, it, it doesn't need to be uh, refrigerated. Thank you, Gila. I'm so happy you love the salad dressing and um, the salad recipe. So I'm going to, but again, if you don't have Ceylan, good old maple syrup is always your best friend, okay? It's interchangeable. 
But, you know, um, again, I have many identities here, but I'm trying to highlight. And if I could come on with one new ingredient, that would be great. And the, the date, honey, the sea lamb, when they're talking about in the Bible, um, a date, uh, when they're talking about honey, they're not talking about bees, honey, right, Ori? What are they talking about? Yep. They're talking about actually the silan, the honey that comes from the dates. It's the syrup of the dates. So that's the, the biblical honey. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just using an old jar. I'm going to be adding my olive oil. And this is also so fruity. It comes from Yaniv, who lives in, Gal in the Galil. And he brings me 20 jerry cans of this stuff. And I sell it from my house. Like it, it gives me such joy. And um, he's this guy who just loves to, you know, he came from high tech and he wants to go back to the land. He doesn't want to be at his computer. And there's a lot of stories like that in Israel. People who have, you know, had these wonderful experiences in high tech, but they're missing, you know, the tangible and the earth and the land. And so he, he left Petah Tikva and went north and he is making olive oil now. So if you come, I promise to introduce you to him. So Shana, I where in the north is he? Because our partner region is in the Etzbeh HaGalil. Is he in our he region? He is in near Har Tabor. Are you guys near Har Tabor? I don't know it well enough to answer. Okay, well, we can make that happen. And we tried <laughs> to get one of your students with us today, Eden, but she was a little bit busy, which is a good sign. It's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, it's a good sign. So you see, not very difficult, guys, what I just did, right? I put some salt, pepper, and I'm shaking it in an old jam jar. And Yella, I have this in my fridge. And having your salad dressings ready in your fridge is, again, a gift to yourself. You know, you don't have to be making tablespoon by tablespoon. And, and you can have an array. Just make sure you label them. Of You know, you could have a Japanese one. You could have your Israeli one. You could have your miso one. You, can, it, you want to eat your, your salads, and you want to be good to yourself make some bright and you see how simple it is to make this. So I'm just going to toss it a little bit on my salad. And I find the best way to toss a salad is with your fingers. When you go to a nice restaurants, this is what they're doing. Very, very gently, not macerating it. And Yella, you have a gorgeous looking salad. And you know what I have? Because there's pomegranates. I have, yeah, so you know oh, what? Wow. To me, they're like a little bit of jewelry. They always bedazzle everything. So if you have them, I put them on everything. Um, and what, Stacey, you could freeze your, your Rimonim, your pomegranate seeds. Seriously? You seriously? After seriously. all that work of picking them apart, I end up always throwing some out that have gone bad. That's a great tip, thank you. Shame, no throwing, no throwing. <laughs> Here we go, here's our salad, but we got to go and figure out more about where these olive trees are, are coming from and how do they get here? Okay, so um, most of the olive uh, oil production actually in Israel comes from the Galilee, um, which produces less than 50% of the consumption of olive oil in Israel, which is quite amazing. Uh, but we use a lot of olive oil. And um, I actually live in Jerusalem in a beautiful, beautiful place next to a great valley. And in this valley, you talked about being seasonal. So this is being next to this valley is actually season. Everything grows in season, which is amazing. And one of the things uh, that I see every day from my window is the olive trees in, uh, in this uh, valley. And I want to show you something that I took picture of um, actually yesterday. Emek HaMatzleva, the Valley of the Cross, is home for an ancient monastery, the Israeli Museum, and also the Knesset, the Israeli Parliament. It is also home for hundreds of olive trees. Olive trees were always a part of the Holy Land's landscape. It was used in many different ways. Um, it's one of the seven species that this land was blessed with. Its oil was used in order to anoint kings, and it's a very important ingredient in the local cuisine. One of the amazing things about olive trees is that every branch goes for a different route. So the trunk is basically a collection of different branches. Uh, you can actually, by looking at it, the trunk, you can see 
how old the tree is. If the branches are separated and there's a hole in the middle, it's more than 200 years old. And in this valley, there's a lot of ancient olive trees. Harvest season started a month ago. A lot of people came to the valley, put fabrics on the ground, started to shake the trees, and then separated the olives from the leaves in order to produce olive oil. We are going in the valley towards an ancient oil press. This is a 1500 year old oil press um, that actually takes the olives and produces oil in the traditional way. The olives are put in, in this very simple machine over here. The wheels roll and they crush the olives. And then the crushed olives are put in, in baskets. They pile the baskets one on top of the other. And by using those heavy stones, they press the baskets. So all of the liquid comes out. Once the liquid is out, they separate the segments from the water, from the oil. And then you can use the olive oil. This is one of the places in the Galilee that still produces in the traditional way. You can still see the stones rolling. And then they take um, the mass and they put it in those baskets. Wow. Wow, look at that. Yeah, so the first olive oil uh, of the season is actually... Um, the one that has a lot of tastes and different flavors and essence. So it's quite amazing to have like fresh olive oil that just came out. Uh, I went to the valley this morning and I brought this, which is the olive uh, branch. And you can actually see some olives over here, but you see that the color is, I would say a bit black. So uh, basically, you know, what's the difference between the green and the black? It's not a different species. It's actually the same olive, but the um, green is immature and this is ripened, this is mature. So every olive goes from green to purplish and then to black. And um, the way to, when you produce olive oil, you take the greens, okay? The blacks are for, um, if you want to salt in it and you wanna pickle it, so you use the black. Um, you know, to eat an olive just like that from the branch, from the tree is horrible. It's so bitter. You have to do something in order to get rid of the bitterness. And uh, what you do usually is you soak it in water with salt, and then you replace the water uh, every uh, couple of days. And then you just uh, brine it in uh, soil, in salt and water for, let's say, two to three weeks until you get a pickled olive. So it's not that easy to make pickled olives, but I usually do every year. This year, I didn't do it yet. I'm looking for the black, very good, big olives in order to salt in them and to make them like Tassos olives, which are great. Mm. So this is about the olives. And uh, back to you, Shauna. Well, I, I, I tried my first year here. I made olives and, uh, you know, I, I, I changed the water every day. It was like like it was like my gym, my gym activity. I never did something so regular in my life. And, um, and then we waited and I swished my bottle and it looked gorgeous. We layered it with lemons and, and on all the salt and garlic and peppercorns and, and it opened up. Oh, I couldn't eat it. It was so horrible. It was so bitter. <laughs> and you know what? My motto is I have to do it wrong before I do it right. And it gives me more and more appreciation for, you know, every, every mama has like bottles in their window of stages of their olives here. And it, it you know, it just, it, it, these things are, they're just part of the culture. It just, you know, it's passed down the secrets. I don't have the secrets. I don't have the, the knack for it. Um, but everybody is the beauty of this place is that everybody's willing to open their kitchens and to share that. And I think that's really what um, this program was about, about sharing um, our stories, sharing our traditions. Um, there's no right or wrong. We all came from the same place and we're 
We're figuring it out. We're holding on. We're letting go of some things, bringing in new. And um, I just want to thank everybody and thank Stacy um, for inviting us again to be inside your community and to be a little bit of light. And you guys bring light to us. And as we said, this place is not the same without you here. And we hope that you know you plan your trips and they may be delayed, but keep planning, keep hoping and keep connecting and, uh, and happy Hanukkah to everybody. So thank you so much. I just wanna show you, Stacey, I know I have to do my, my last hurrah. These are the, the latkes and I'm a big believer. You guys are from the land of snow. So I love my icing sugar shaker. And giving everything a little bit of some snow um, always gives a little bit of a party. Um, and a, just a light sugar. Um, I have some little maple syrup and I'm gonna be doing my little bit of a dip. And we also have the gorgeous salad that we have right here. Um, again, wow. use what you've got. Think about color, think about texture. Think about Israel, use those dates and, um, and uh, you know, and, and just keep eating those greens. Shauna, thank you so very much. You certainly brought the light into our kitchen. You are such a joy and you inspire me all the time. So we're thrilled that you were able to do this with us and Ari to give us a taste of Machna Yehuda Market. My mouth is watering just seeing everything and that beautiful color of that <laughs> olive oil, just fantastic. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, you should have received the recipes this morning. Uh, we did record this. If you came in a little bit late, you can, we'll be sharing it so you can watch the beginning again. I did take your words to heart, Shauna. My first trip out of Canada is going to be to Israel. And so I hope to see you very soon. And I hope other people are going to consider doing that as well. What does that say? Sababa. <laughs> um, this event was made possible because of the Edmonton and Calgary UJA uh, campaigns and we certainly uh, hope and, and thank everybody who has made a gift and if you would like to make a gift to the UJ campaign if you have not had a chance to do that you can visit either city's website uh, Calgary or Jewish uh, Edmonton to uh, to do that um, anything uh, other than we need to bring Shauna vanilla or maple syrup when we travel to Israel is there anything that we should be adding <laughs> Susan Thank you. All. So only this is a wonderful event. Thank you, Sean. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Arik. And I hope everyone had a wonderful time. And uh, eat up. Make it all and eat it. Happy. If you have any out. questions, you can always send it to I'm at Chef Sean at Gmail. And Arik, what's your email? Arik.tour at gmail.com. Any travel Happy. questions you want to get, get excited, Arik is your hotline. I will make Come one. Come visit Jerusalem. <laughs> I will make one quick plug. If you enjoy cooking events, we have a babka baking class coming up in December with Larry Harris. He is a uh, local celebrity who was also featured on CBC's Great Canadian Baking Show. So we're very much looking forward to that in December. And we have lots of events for Hanukkah, as does Calgary. So keep your eye out for some of the wonderful things that are happening. <laughs>